Well, we turn to the book of Exodus in chapter 12, and as we read those verses 29 through to 51, there are verses uh, for this evening. Don't worry, I'm not going to be like I was this morning, covering every little detail. I'm just trying to take the great theme of Exodus chapter 12. It's a wonderful, wonderful chapter, it really is. And if there's one particular verse which sums up which we want to say tonight, verse 42, it says, It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for the bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel (coughs) in all their generations. And of course the Jews still today remember the Passover. They may not understand like we understand it, but isn't that amazing? They realised that they were a people who had been delivered by Almighty God from the land of Egypt. Now, if there's a title in the light of that verse, it would be this, A Night to be Remembered. A Night to be Remembered. A little boy comes home from Sunday school. Mum and Dad say, And what did you learn today? The reply was, We learned all about Moses. Mum and Dad said, Did you learn anything about the Lord Jesus Christ? His reply was, It will be a long time before we learn about the Lord Jesus Christ because he comes at the end of the Bible. Well, of course, the little boy didn't understand that the Bible is full of Christ. One of the first books that were ever bought me as a Christian was Christ in all the scriptures. And especially when we come to the thinking about the Passover, let alone the rest of the book of Exodus, and let alone the rest of the Old Testament, you see Christ. He's promised. He's pictured. There's types. There's illustrations. And the Old Testament just brims over with Christ. And of course the Christian, who's had their eyes, their spiritual eyes open, They see this. So when they turn to the Bible in their own private readings, one of the things they're looking for is Christ. And here in Exodus chapter 12, the Lord Jesus Christ is shown as the Passover lamb. Do you ever stop and think why the Lord gives so much detail about the Passover lamb? Well, the answer is simple, isn't it? Because he wants to tell us about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one of the great wonders of the Bible. That's why we believe it's the word of God. No man could have written this chapter with such detail how the lamb ought to be without spot or blemish, about how it be separated, about how it should be roasted, about the blood. No man would have written about that. But God is teaching his people of the one who is coming, who won't just deliver them from Egypt, but deliver them from their sins. It says here, and you read it last week, chapter 12, verse 13, God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. What a great thought that is, as we will see. Well, Israel, uh, Egypt had endured nine plagues, but Israel was still in Egypt. Pharaoh still had power over them. They were still in slavery. But now we come to the great deliverance of the Lord. Take a lamb. Kill a lamb. Take the blood of that lamb. Put it on the door lintel and the doorposts. And he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So the book of Exodus, and particularly the chapter we're thinking about tonight, we'll see, speaks so well of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now the first thing, the first point is the midnight cry. The midnight cry. Did you notice how our reading began? And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn of the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat upon his throne unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. And in verse 30 it says, And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. Now this is incredible. All the Israelites, they'd slain their lamb. That evening, they'd eaten the lamb. But the most important thing, they'd applied the blood of the lamb to the doorposts and the door lintel because they knew that God had said, where I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, I don't know if you can enter into a little illustration with me. Just imagine it's getting near to midnight. Shall we say a couple of hours away from midnight? Now, I'm not quite sure how they told the, t uh, how they, uh, uh, told the time in those days. They didn't have clocks, obviously. A sundial wouldn't have been much good near midnight, would it? But however they t t told the time, just imagine the clock is ticking towards midnight. And the little boy says to his dad, Dad, am I your firstborn? Father replies, Yes, you are. Now the little boy knew what God had said. All the firstborn in the land would die. So the little boy replies, Dad, have you put the blood on the doorpost and lintel because I can't see it? His dad replied, Son, it's not important that you see it. The most important thing is that God sees it because he has promised where I see the blood, I will pass over you. Do you know something, ladies and gentlemen? The most important thing is not your good works, is not your faithful attendance at the church, is not your giving of money to good causes. That's not what God wants to see. God wants to see if you have applied the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the atoning Lamb, and you've come and you've trusted Christ, the one who was crucified at Calvary's cross, who shed his blood to wash your sins away. That's the most important thing. And on that great day of judgment, the Lord will be not looking for what you've done in your life. He'll be looking for the blood that you're sheltering under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then the boy says to his dad and asks another question. Are you sure, dad, that the blood alone is sufficient to save me from the angel of death? What if I'm really, really good for the next hour? Will that help? Will that add to the blood so that I'm saved? His father replies, the blood is sufficient. Do you know something? There's thousands of people, they understand something about the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. They even understand that he died for their sins. But there's something within them which says, I've got to add to what Jesus has done. I've got to join this organisation. I've got to do this particular thing. I've got to be in membership at a certain place in order that I might add something to my salvation. God says, when I see the blood, that blood 
is sufficient to save your soul. Now some people lack assurance because they haven't worked that out. When we go and stand before God, our only plea is that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. His blood is sufficient. And then the boy says, but Dad, did you sacrifice the right lamb? That one you selected on the tenth day, was he without spot and blemish? Was he the right lamb? And on the fourteenth day, that lamb that you killed, you took its blood, was it the right blood? Did you roast it correctly, Dad? Was it the right lamb? And the father replies, Yes, son, it was the lamb that God told us to select. It was the lamb without spot and blemish. And he was roasted and it's that blood that is on the doorpost and the door lintel. Do you know something, ladies and gentlemen? There's lots and lots of people. They've got the wrong lamb. They've got the wrong lamb. The Jehovah's Witnesses have got the wrong lamb. They deny the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. The modernists, they've got the wrong lamb. They despise the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They've got the wrong lamb. Some say that Jesus Christ was just a man, a prophet. They've got the wrong lamb. We must have the right lamb. The one who is God and yet truly man. The one who offered him himself up as a propitiation, an atoning propitiation on Calvary's cross to shed his blood. Only the blood of God the Son will do to wash away our sins. So God can say, when I see the blood of my dear Son applied to a sinner, then I will pass over you. But then the boy, he says one more thing. He says, Dad, can we really believe what God has said? The angel of death is soon coming. Can we really believe that God has said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you? Can we believe that? And his father replies, Son, those words were said by a God that cannot lie. Everything God has said in the nine plagues has come to pass. God cannot fail. God can be fully trusted in all that he does and all that he says. And we will lay our trust in every word. And God has said, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. A lot of people have that problem with assurance because they don't believe what God has said. They don't know their Bibles, they don't read their Bibles and then they wonder why they lack assurance. Assurance only comes when you know the precious word of God and your trust in the word which has been written by a God that cannot lie. Well, that midnight hour came and what a tragedy it was for the Egyptians from Pharaoh on the throne to the captive in the dungeon. In every home, there was a dead firstborn. There were tears, there were cries. A tragedy, a judgment had come upon the Egyptians. And here in our passage, the Egyptians, they suffer a terrible judgment, but the Israelites, 
All their firstborn are saved because of the blood of the Lamb. Years ago, we used to sing a hymn. You won't find it these days unless you search carefully. But it's a great thought. When God of old, the way of life, would teach to all his own, he placed them safe beyond the reach of death by blood alone. By Christ, the sinless Lamb of God, the precious blood was shed. When he fulfilled God's holy word, he suffered in our stead. The wrath of God, that was our due, upon the Lamb was laid, and by the shedding of his blood, the debt for us was paid. How calm! Think of the midnight hour in Egypt. How calm the judgment hour shall pass to all who do obey the word of God and trust the blood and make the word their stay. It is his word, God's precious word. It stands forever true. When I, the Lord, shall see the blood, I will pass over you. It's a wonderful thing to be a Christian. It's a wonderful thing to know that you're trusting in Christ's atoning blood. And that's why it's one of the great truths of the Christian gospel that Christ atoned for our sins. There's no other way to get right with Almighty God. So there was a midnight cry what tragedy came upon the Egyptians. What joy came to the Israelites. Think of that day of judgment that we are thinking about this morning. What a day that will be. There will be a cry from the ungodly because they're not trusting the atoning blood of Christ. But for the Christian, we'll be singing, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Now there's one other thing I want you to notice from this midnight cry. Right in the middle of the night, Pharaoh calls for Moses and Aaron. This is verse 30. Of course, Pharaoh is in distress. His firstborn has died. He is a distressed man. Now Pharaoh's no longer talking about compromise. In verse 31 he says, Go, serve the Lord as you have said. Verse 32 he says, Be gone, get out of the land. Now remember, in the previous chapters, Pharaoh wanted to compromise, didn't he? He says, Worship in the land, don't go out there in the wilderness, you just stay in the land and worship. Don't go very far away, compromise. Just let the men go. Don't take your flocks with you. You just go out in the wilderness. To... He was compromising. He said, look, let's have a compromise. But Moses said, not a hoof shall be left behind. But here is now Pharaoh. He is saying, be gone. Get out of the land. No compromise. Now, did you notice what he said at the end of verse 32? He says, Pharaoh in his great distress, he says, bless me also. In other words, pray for me also. Is this going to make Pharaoh's heart change? Is Pharaoh all of a sudden going to turn to God? Is Pharaoh going to be finished with his own ways and acknowledge that the Lord is God and Israel are the people of God. Well, we know what happens, don't we? Get to chapter 14. Pharaoh hasn't changed his heart. Pharaoh is the still same old Pharaoh. He's getting his chariots ready and he's going to chase the Israelites. When he comes to the Red Sea, he thinks he's going to get across, follow the Israelites across. But the Red Sea comes. And that is the end of Pharaoh 
and his army. Do you know something? This is a big lesson to learn. You'll meet people and they're in their crisis hour. Something has happened in their lives, some tragedy, and they'll say, pray for me. And they'll show a bit of interest in spiritual things. They even might say, well, I'll come along to church sometime. But nothing ever happens. When the crisis is over, they go back to their old ways. That's why we as Christians need to be discerning. Is it just the moment of crisis that has made them say, pray for me? Or is there a real spiritual desire within their heart of hearts? It's a big lesson to learn. You meet a lot of people. They have a crisis hour and you think, oh, they might really want to seek after the Lord. But give it a few weeks, months, that interest is gone and they're back to their old ways. So, the midnight cry, the midnight hour had come and now passed and in Egypt all those firstborn of the Egyptians had died. Just think about the tragedy it was and it was all because Pharaoh fought against God and resisted God and resisted the call of God and did harm to the people of God. This terrible tragedy came upon him. Now we move on to the second point. A journey commenced. A journey commenced. Now you'll remember when they were to eat the Passover meal in the instructions given in the first part of chapter 12, they were to eat it with their loins girded, that means they needed to be dressed, ready for a journey, with their shoes on and with their staff in their hand. They were going to begin a journey. Dread me the blood of the Lamb had saved them. They were going to begin a journey. That's an interesting thought, isn't it? 53 years ago, I began a journey. And it started when I heard about the blood of the Lamb. When I heard about the Lord Jesus Christ dying on the cross for sinners like me, and I knew I needed to be converted that night. What a journey. I didn't know what that journey was all about at that moment in time. All I know, 53 years later, wonderfully, the Lord has brought me on a journey. And like the Israelites, they didn't know where they were going. They didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know what their experience would be. But that's what happens when you become a Christian. But everyone who becomes a Christian begins their journey at, at the cross where Jesus died. And they want that blood of Christ to wash them from their every sin. So they're going to begin a journey. Now I want you to notice three things about the beginning of that journey. Number one, what they did not take with them. What they did not take with them. And it was leaven. Leaven. You'll remember chapter 12, verse 15. When the lamb came into their house, all the leaven was to go out of their house. When they began their journey, they were to eat of the lamb. They were to go in the strength of the lamb but they were not to take with them that which was leaven. Now, the big lesson is this. If you're going to have the lamb, you can't have the leaven. If you're going to go and walk in the strength of the lamb, which was their last meal before they began their journey, you can't take with the leaven. This is the lesson. In the Bible, leaven is a picture of evil, a picture of sin. Like leaven, sin begins in a small way but gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Leaven is a picture of error, false doctrine. 
And this is the picture. If you're going to have the lamb, you can't have the leaven. If you're going to have the strength of the lamb, you can't have the leaven. You've got to leave Egypt without any leaven. Now I think you've got the application quite simple there. If you're going to have the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, you can't have your sinful ways. You can't have your sin. You can't have your old ways. Out with the leaven. In with the lamb. You can't have your leaven. That's a big lesson, isn't it? If you're going to know any blessing and strength in the Christian life, you've got to put away the leaven, the sin, the errors, your sinful, wicked ways. So they couldn't take leaven with them. The second thing is, what did they take with them? Well, verses 35 and 36, you remember how they went and took of the Egyptians the jewels of silver and gold and raiment. In fact, anything that the Israelites wanted, the Egyptians would say, just have it, we want to get rid of you. And they went out of the land very rich indeed because the Egyptians just wanted to get rid of them. There they were, weeping over their firstborn. They'd give them anything just to get rid of them from their land. Now, this is a big lesson, isn't it? They went out with riches. Now, you can do two things with riches. What did the Israelites do? I'll tell you the first thing. They made a golden calf and they worshipped an idol. All their earrings they put in and out came this golden calf, so Aaron said. With riches, you can do that which is evil, idolatrous. But a bit later on, when there was an offering, they wanted to build a tabernacle of the Lord, the people of God gave willingly. And that's what you can do. Riches can be for evil, or they can be for good for the Lord's work. And that's a very big and very important lesson. So they didn't take with them leaven. They took with them riches. But there's one more thing. Who went with them? Well, verse 38 tells us, And a mixed multitude went up also with them. Now, this mixed multitude, they were not Israelites, some of them could have been Egyptians. Some of them perhaps other nationalities which had been living in Egypt. They saw the great works of the Lord. They saw something of what they had to do to be saved. And they, as it were, became Israelites in name. So they joined the Israelites for this journey. A mixed multitude. Later on in the journey, the mixed multitude were a problem. Just one reference, Numbers 11, verse 4. This mixed multitude started the children of Israel to murmur. They complained about the leadership. They complained about the manner. And they wanted to go back to Egypt. And they swayed some of the Israelites in their bad ways. Now this is a big lesson also. We thought about it this morning. So often there are the wheat and the tares together in the church. And yet so often, those of a mixed multitude start to have a bit of a say in how the church should be run. Their non-Christian attitudes, their unscriptural practices begin to hold sway. And that's why so many churches go wrong and lose sight of the gospel. Because a mixed multitude begins to leave the church. And it's tragic. Even in good evangelical churches, this can be a problem. The mixed multitude. <coughs> I'm very fearful these days. But so many churches bend over backwards to get the world in and make them comfortable. I'll tell you this, 
they'll have moral problems and spiritual problems in years to come because they have not asked the important questions whether they've really been converted and what they really believe. And this is so often. And I'll tell you how it starts in a church. First of all, they're like those mixed multitude in Numbers 11. They'll start murmuring against the leadership. Then they'll start murmuring, now the manner, the food, they'll start murmuring about the preaching. And then they'll start wanting to say, let's go back to Egypt. Let's have a few worldly things in our churches. And that's how the rot begins in a Christian church. So, a mixed multitude. So a journey commenced. What a journey it will be. And that's what the book, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, before we get to the book of Joshua, is all about. The third thing I want to say, the perfect timing of the Lord. Now, if you look at verses 40 and 41, it says, Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now, way back there in Genesis, God had said to Abraham, for 400 years, your descendants will live in a strange land. Now, when it says 400 years, it could have been just a round number because the Apostle Paul in Galatians understands it as 430 years, exactly what it is here in these verses. 430 years. Did you notice? On the self-same day, God's timing is perfect. Now, how do we understand that? Well, I think we understand it like this. I remember years ago, Anna and myself went to some lectures. And one of the big things was, this man was going on about the date of the Exodus. Now, if you look at the theological books, it's always a matter of dispute. What date was the, uh, the Exodus? Well, to my little mind, I, c- I couldn't get my head around all that. That was far beyond me. But to the simple believer comes to this and says, on the self-same day, 430 years after, well, my understanding is when Jacob went to Egypt to be with Joseph during the famine. I believe that was the beginning of the 430 years. And God's calendar was back on time. On the self-same day, just as he said to Abraham, they came out of the promised land. What a tremendous thought that is. Now, there's another tremendous thought as well. When God gave Abraham that promise, Abraham didn't have any children. And yet he promised that his descendants would be like the grains of sand on a seashore. How many came out of Egypt? Well, we read 600,000 men on foot. That's more like you're talking about the army of Israel, let alone women and children. And some have estimated it could well have been about 2 million who came out of Egypt. Isn't that tremendous? God promises to Abraham when he didn't have any children, and here's God's wonderful promise being fulfilled in a very wonderful way. What a lesson. And the lesson is very simple. God is always faithful to his word. God's promises cannot fail. And God's timing is always right and on time. In the fullness of time, he sent forth his son to be born of a woman. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again, it will be bang on time. I can't give you a day, that would be foolish. But the Lord knows it will be exactly on time. Now, I'm going to finish in a minute. One last point. I was a bit long this morning, so I'm going to make sure I finish in reasonable time this time. Better not look at the clock. Oh, well, okay. (laughs) 
Point number four. An ordinance to be kept. Now verses 43 through to 51. God says, every year at that time, you need to remember this great night of deliverance. This wonderful night when you were delivered from the land of Egypt, from the hand of Pharaoh, from the place of slavery. They were to remember it throughout all their generations. And as you read the um, history of the children of Israel in the Old Testament, sometimes they forgot. Sometimes they rejoiced and they were great times of Passover. But sometimes they were indifferent towards it. It shows them, so it shows you their spiritual state before the Lord. Now here's some lovely instructions and we can see instructions here about the Lord's table. Why do we gather around the Lord's table? We remember our deliverance. Not from Egypt, but from our sins. We remember the Lamb that was slain, our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who, as it were, roasted in the, the wrath of God to save us from the wrath to come. His blood that was shed. And we come around the table. But please notice what it says in verse 43. There shall no stranger eat thereof. In other words, only those who are in the family. Only those who have known this great deliverance in their lives. Now, if you're not a believer tonight... I cannot invite you to the Lord's table. But I can invite you to Christ. That you might know sins forgiven. And then you will be more than glad, be more than happy to invite you to the Lord's table to remember the one who is your deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And once again, it's very, very sober in thought. You know, I think it was mentioned last week, there was no blood on the doorstep. It's a terrible thing to trample underfoot the blood of Jesus Christ. And when people come to the Lord's table without any thought of whether they're a Christian or not, when they know they're in rebellion against God and yet they partake of the elements, they are treading underfoot the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I give you an invitation not to come to the table, but to come to Christ and be forgiven.